it's talking, uh, it's always there. And that's the first tip off. Uh, the second thing is that the patient will describe episodes that have to do with elevated temperature. Uh, they sweat, uh, they have flares, uh, they're, they're oily, they, they say they're real hot. Uh, they wake up at, at night and their bedclothes are wet. So they're having flares of high temperature. And when you have constant pain and a patient tells you that they're uh, having these kind of episodes, you can pretty well assume that's what it is. Now today, you can also take some blood tests of what's called inflammatory markers, and they will be elevated. Now two of the most common that have been around for generations is what's called the C-reactive protein and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, abbreviated ESR. Now these two common things are known to every physician, every nurse practitioner, every PA, and they do, they go up oftentimes in the serum, and so that's another little bit of a confirmation. But basically, a patient who has constant pain is there all the time and describes episodes of heat. Interestingly, the, uh, there are only about four or five diseases that cause most of the severe neuroinflammation or centralized pain. Uh, I'll give you a rundown on those. Uh, the, 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 and the most common is probably adhesive arachnoiditis. Uh, the second one are genetic diseases. Now we've identified the disease Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, sickle cell anemia in, in the black population, and then there are some lesser known ones, uh, but kyphoscoliosis is, is a genetic disease. There's something called Marfan syndrome, rheumatoid spondylitis. So their genetic diseases are a big cause of this. And percentage-wise, they seem to be emerging in the population. Uh, another cause is what's called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, and some people call that chronic regional pain syndrome. Those are kind of the big three. Uh, now, there are some lesser known causes like post-stroke. Uh, you have post-viral autoimmune disorders. You have some neuropathies both inside the abdomen and pelvis as well as in the legs. Uh, but those are the major ones. Uh, I, did, I didn't mention traumatic brain injury. That's another one that's in there. But the big three are genetic diseases, arachnoiditis, and reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Neuroinflammation is a sleeper in this sense. It's like inflammation in the knee in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. It can come and go. We know how to suppress it and how to suppress it and put it into remission, but it'll come back. And neuroinflammation does the same thing. Uh, what I'm trying to get across is this. Neuroinflammation inside the brain and the spinal cord has to be assumed to be a lifetime condition. It may go ahead and burn itself out and resolve, but one can't count on that. And so physicians get uh, misled. The patient's doing beautifully, they're functioning well, the pain's down, they may even be getting off their medications, but the inflammation may come back. We do not quite understand why this is, but there is a cell inside the central nervous system called the microglial cell that causes the neuroinflammation. And once there, we don't know how to get rid of it, but we can control it, we can suppress it, and one must do that if you're gonna keep the pain down and let the patient be functional. And hopefully, uh, we're going to get some cures out of this one of these days as we get better at treating it. At this time, the primary care physician is just pretty much thinks all he knows is symptomatic treatment. What we call the anti-epileptic treatments like with gabapentin, uh, Topramax, uh, Soma, those kind of things. Then you've got the opioids, of course. You've got your common anti-inflammatory agents like Celebrex. But neuroinflammation doesn't respond very well to the same drugs that arthritis responds to. And the average primary care doctor at this time doesn't know. Uh, and, but what he, what he does know is that a lot of the drugs that seem to help are drugs that have been discovered that are old time drugs. Drugs like metformin, acetazolamide, pentoxifilin, 
Uh, these are old drugs that have been around a long time. The one anti-inflammatory agent that seems to work, which is very common, is indocin. And then there's a drug called Toradol, which is used in practically every emergency room in the country as an anti-inflammatory and pain reliever. So these are drugs that need to be used by the practicing primary care physician and the nurse practitioner and the PA. And once they're taught, they can easily administer these things. But it's like anything else, if somebody doesn't teach you or show you, how can, you just don't know.